Thank you all for being on the, um, this extraordinary event. So many of you have come such a long way. Um, it is utterly wonderful to see you here today. Um, cultural intelligence. Someone told me that the two words didn't actually belong to each other. <laughs> um, my father was a trader. And we used, to, um, we used to talk about the world, and he used to talk about how the world was becoming so much smaller. And um, as he talked about how it was becoming smaller, he told me that actually it wouldn't fulfill the promise. Because logically says that as the world becomes smaller and more interconnected, it might just become more coherent. And he promised me that it would not fulfill that promise. Because though leaders would be working together across all kinds of boundaries that they had never dreamt of before, what he saw was an increasing number of the flying dead. He coined the phrase for me, the flying dead. People who travel and fly around the world and who land for a week, or a day, or a month, or a year, or a week, and have not a clue what is happening, and are told to deliver immediately, before they fly somewhere else. My father used to tell me that we wouldn't, we wouldn't have the great leaders who would make it coherent for us. We would have ghosts flying the world, sadly. And I think, in some ways, he proved to be right. You see organizations that spend an enormous amount of money developing global brands. And you find in organizations spending an enormous amount of money developing global structures and not putting a great deal of effort into developing the global people who will run them. People who will be required to cross north and south, to cross east and west, to cross south and south, to cross developing and developed. And we have to, we know we have to, because we're all leaders. And the job of a leader is about making things happen and solving problems. The trouble is that most problems are pretty good at crossing boundaries. It's just us who are pretty hopeless at it. And we tend to stay within the boundaries and say that within the boundaries, we will crack those problems that are splurging and scrooching and splurging across the boundaries. And they're not just geographical boundaries you're here. They're not just ge geographical boundaries. They're boundaries of beliefs. They're boundaries of sectors. They're boundaries of generations. There are, of course, people in this audience who are rats who work for the private sector, <laughs> who are making money. There are, of course, people in this audience like me who are totally incompetent people who work for NGOs. And none of us have any idea what we're doing. And of course, there are people from governments who are simply wasting resources. <laughs> And the sectors, uh, tell me if any country it's not true. The sectors seem doomed to live in their own worlds and to waste the resources in the gaps between us all. And then you have the generations. It's not just geography and sectors and backgrounds. It's generation. Have you heard it? Have you been to a speech recently when somebody's talked about harnessing the next generation? Have you stopped them and reminded them what a harness looks like? A big, thick bit of leather that you strap around an animal's mouth, either to force it to not do something or to force it to do something it doesn't want to do. The thought that all of us are harnessing the generation is utterly terrifying. 
There's only one thing we should be doing, and that's called de-harnessing it. We need cultural intelligence to be able to cross the different cultures. It's an honourable thing, coming of an honourable line, cultural intelligence. Um, there was IQ, wasn't there? Yeah. Hands up anybody who didn't look at their six-month-old baby and claim that this was going to be the most intelligent person the world has ever known. <laughs> yes, as evidenced by how they ate their breakfast that morning. <laughs> IQ was so incredibly important, and, the, and a penny for all those people who say to me, well, if you could just take the people issues out of this, we could really make progress. What a fool. And then we began to develop EQ, dangerous stuff, because it was usually associated with women. You know, that sort of wet, emotional rubbish. Um, the most difficult thing in the world is people. But the trouble is that when you got more and more EQ, you tended to meet people who would say, I'm really good with people. And they always forget the few extra words that need to go after it. I'm really good with people like me. <laughs> now, are you any good with people who aren't like you? Because that's called cultural intelligence. What makes a leader culturally intelligent? So. Um, I reckon I've coined a new kind of writing of a book, which is you go and see everybody you know and then write up everything they tell you on the basis you don't really know much yourself. So I spent a long time wandering around talking to people who I thought had cultural intelligence. Or at least, if they didn't have it, they'd met somebody else who had it and they had thought about it a bit. And I think there's two things just to go into a bit this morning, this afternoon. One is a distinction which I became more and more interested in, which is the distinction between core and flex. Come back to that. Core and flex. C-O-R-E and flex. And the second thing to come back to is people who managed to figure out how to work through what I would call the cultural intelligence paradox. Come back to that too. So the first slide goes into this issue of core and flex. People who have cultural intelligence to me had really, really, really thought through what their core was. Yeah? Usually starting with what I would not do. Or sometimes even what I will always do. What is my core? And everybody always says, oh, I know what you mean. You mean values. And I'd say, no, I don't mean values. And they say, well, identity. And I say, well, I just don't mean identity. And they say, we don't mean anything as small as behaviors. And I say, yeah, sure, I do. Um, it's everything. Um, in my core, I suppose, is a passion for freedom of speech. In my core is an inability to figure out how to work with somebody else unless I use my eyes. <laughs> And unless I see their eyes. It's in my core, I have to admit it, it is. Um, in my core is that I can adapt to almost anything that another leader does as long as they have a monthly team meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a truly wonderful man I met um, who I love dearly and I talked to him about his core and he said, you know, in my core, Julia, I would never ever drive in a bus lane because deeply in his core is that he is never so important that he would be more important than other people. And his image is that he would never drive in a bus lane. And that people that you trust <laughs> have a core and have spent time figuring out what it is. And then there's flex. There's things that you will go with. And what are the things in your flex? And the thing that's interesting is that the more flexible your flex is, the more people trust you. And the more inflexible your core is, the more people trust you. If that makes sense. And everything lies within it. So the next slide gives an example, I think, the kinds of people that I think most people find difficult with 
are the ones who have huge, huge flex, vast flex. Occasionally you meet somebody who, who's into sales and do you not sometimes sit there and you think, that, I wonder what they wouldn't sell me. <laughs> Ju I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. Yes? And then you have people who have tiny flecks. My grandparents were like that. They came from the northwest of England. They came from Bolton. <coughs> and they saw no need whatsoever to flex to anybody because they were pretty well clear that they knew everything. <laughs> and that there really was very little need. I mean, you might just little on the margins. But on the whole, they were all core. And both those groups, I don't think, work. Either the first who'll go anywhere. I don't know, one of my favourite expressions that I came across writing the book was a definition by Robert Frost, which is, I've become so liberal, I can't even agree with myself. <laughs> So either Robert Frost or my grandparents, I think, would struggle with cultural intelligence. The people who are interesting also talk to me about how their core reflex has moved over their lives. Yeah? With different propositions. Because actually, I actually believe that a lot of the cultural intelligence comes on that line between core reflex and your willingness very carefully to occasionally move it. Um, and to keep that line under constant review and real scrutiny this week, because you have an opportunity of a lifetime to look hard at that line and to move it a bit. I met a young man, um, interesting man, who said, you know, Julia, I actually believe that if you're going to develop cultural intelligence properly as a senior leader, your core almost has to have gone down to almost nothing while you were a teenager. Because while you were a teenager, you had to force yourself to do all kinds of different things that you know you shouldn't really be doing at all. And only by doing that, he said, will you actually then develop the real core that you need in your 20s. I don't know if he was right or he was wrong. I, one thing I do observe is that your core gets smaller, if you're like me, as you go on. Someone, does anybody ever use that word wisdom with you? Mm -hmm. I reckon the word wisdom is just a word to make you feel better about getting old. <laughs> but. I think probably you're constantly reevaluating your core and really saying to yourself, are you sure? And I think over time, probably you get, it gets smaller and smaller, though I am now, oh, 56 quite soon, um, 21st of April, and I reckon I think my core might be getting bad-temperedly bigger again. Um, and I think the other thing is, that you have to concentrate pretty hard on flexing the flex, because that's what you're supposed to do with the flex. You're supposed to flex it. Yeah? So when I was going to do some work in Jeddah, and they told me I had to wear an abaya, and I said, well, I'm not going to do that. And they said, hang on, Julia, I thought how you dressed was in your flex. And I went, no, you're right. I think I'll have to wear an abaya. Yeah? yeah? But you forget to flex. We all forget to flex. We shove it in flex, and then guess what? We've oscillated more than, yes? Very, very rapidly. The, it grows, it gets smaller, and Elspeth wakes up and goes to the next slide. <laughs> and as it, I think, gets smaller, you also find bits in your core that you're not very proud of. And I think as you find those bits, like everybody from the private sector is a rat, well, actually, you probably cannot substantiate that argument. And everybody from the voluntary sector is useless and whatever. And actually, slowly, your biases, your knots, slide into your flex. And then I think as you go on, 
you begin to realize that there are one or two bits that are knots that you're never really be able to get rid of because they're so deep. And they're not good because they produce you blind spots. But the very least you can do is to recognize them and make sure that they're your problem, not somebody else's. I was um, brought up French. I remember when I first came to London and was working in London and began to realize that I wasn't particularly racially prejudiced like lots of people I saw in London. And I thought, that is pretty good. That's helpful. That'll help me, give me slightly less biases. And then I started doing some work in just the northern part of Notting Hill, where there were an enormous amount of people from the Moroccan community. And I suddenly found this little bit of French in me that was about 25 years old. And completely unconsciously, I took a step back. Because North Africans was something that, having left France 20 years before, I always still took a step back. It was one of those knots somewhere in my core I wasn't even aware of. And as far as I'm concerned, I have always ruthlessly in my career, ever since, made sure that I am completely surrounded by North Africans and always involved in something that's about the knot in my core, which I haven't managed to move to flex, but at least I figured out how to sort it to some extent. And I think then as you go on, you become more and more conscious that you become obsessed with your own core and flex, and you forget that it takes two. <laughs> and crossing over with other people. So interestingly, when I came back from doing the work in Saudi, having been in an abaya, <laughs> um, my colleagues, well, one colleague said to me, then why do people from Saudi not wear Western clothes when they come to the UK? And of course, it's a totally stupid question. Because what I wear is in my flex, and what they wear is in their core. So actually, the question is ridiculous. And how you overlap. I, I did a speech, there's a great conference in Cambridge every year, which is about very, very senior women businesswomen from, from, the, from the US. And I... Um, had committed to doing it, and I was running at Liverpool Street Station, which is the station you go to. And I ran for this train, as usual, late. And just as I was about to get on the train, I fell over and smashed up my knee, something rotten, had a big hole in my trousers, yeah? So I got on the train, got to Cambridge, late as ever, got to Judge Business School, late as ever, rushed in, managed to get rid of the blood, but there was a big hole in my trousers. Yeah? And I started talking to these women, and then halfway through I said, listen, can we just stop for a minute? Because deep in my core, if I say I'm going to do something, I will kill myself to do it. And deep in your core is that you would never, ever present yourself in front of an audience with a hole in your trousers. I'm not asking you to be like me, but I am asking you to recognize that we have different cores. And to still listen to the speech even the, and stop staring at me knee, yeah? <laughs> so core and flex seems to me to be a key element of having cultural intelligence. I'm going very fast, but I hope it's useful. The next big issue, it seems to me, on cultural intelligence is that it is by definition a bit of a mess because I can't get cultural intelligence unless you choose to give it me. Yeah? I, can't, I can read a few books and I can watch some videos, but ultimately, Mohammed, I will not have cultural intelligence. We met how many hundred years, years ago, and you are part of teaching me cultural intelligence because you chose to tell me things about the way the world looks to you that built my cultural intelligence. And you won't trust me with it <laughs> unless you reckon I have enough cultural intelligence to receive it. 
So I think that ultimately the trouble about cultural intelligence is it's sort of circular. You don't really get it till you have enough to receive it. Does that make sense? So if, if the proposition is that I'm only going to get it if you choose to give it me, as I wrote the book, I became clear that there were three prerequisites to be able to build enough trust for you to give it me. And then there was a fourth I couldn't get my head around. I wasn't sure. The first three were pretty straightforward. That, that you will not develop real cultural intelligence unless you have a deep interest in other human beings. I think myself that that's a prerequisite of all leadership, but I think it's a particular prerequisite of cultural intelligence. The ability to cross boundaries and to thrive across them is that you have to have a deep enough interest in other human beings, and it has to be a deep enough interest that you do not regard yourself as the benchmark against which everybody else is judged. I think that the second one is a total determination about yourself. To find the knots, to find the bias, to constantly move that line between core and flex, to ruthlessly analyze whether your view is based on judgment or prejudgment. Whether what I think about you, sir, is based on my observations or my prejudice. <laughs> Two things that are very difficult to distinguish very often. Um, and to figure out the situations in which I feel superior to other people, or the situations which are just as wicked when I know that I feel inferior to other people. Because without doubt, I'm at my worst in those situations, I am at my most arrogant if I feel inferior to you. <laughs> and I think the third one is the stamina to go on an endless journey, where if you ever think you've got it, you've probably lost it. The cultural intelligence is a very, very, very long journey. It's a pretty tough journey, meeting other people, and most importantly, rather unpleasantly, meeting yourself. The last one, which I could not get my head around, and which I tell you the story of prior to this book coming out, um, is I became more and more clear that probably you will not trust me enough to give me cultural intelligence unless you, are th you believe that I am somebody who will stand up to the opposite, which is cultural intolerance. So tussling with that proposition, I went to see somebody in London whom I love dearly and is a remarkable leader. And I said to him, if you've got four people in a room, and one of the people in the room says something that you regard as culturally intolerant, should you say something or should you shut up? And this man for whom I have and remain, I still have an enormous amount of respect, laughed his head off and he said, Julia, you will never grow up, will you? And he said, what's the use in taking people on like that? You'll never change them. And I said, but I don't care about them. What about the other people in the room? <laughs> they need to see you doing this. And he told me I was perfectly silly and I needed to grow up. So fortunately, the next week, I was in the presence of the chairman of Com Purpose in Hong Kong, a very remarkable man called Ron Akuli. And I asked him, and he laughed. And he, I said, um, but Ron, I am increasingly of the view that my generation confuse cultural intelligence and politeness. They think that the job is to actually get through a week like this without offending anybody. Yeah? If you can just be polite enough, that's fine. 
And I said, but that's not enough, is it? And he said, no, it isn't. And I said, but Ron, you're 71. How come you can see this? And he said, well, Julia, you have not got enough cultural intelligence to realize, Julia, that my father was Chinese and my mother was Indian and I am a half-caste. And half-castes in Hong Kong do not become the chairman of the stock exchange. And he said, I've seen this all my life, Julia. You have to stand up. Otherwise, the people around you will not trust you and give you cultural intelligence. And he said, but the trouble is, it takes about 30 seconds. Because when it happens, you're sitting there thinking, did I just hear that right? What the hell do I say now? What will they think? How am I going to do it? And he said, the trouble is that often, by the time you've got your head around it, the 30 seconds are up and the moment is lost. So my luck is that I then met Roel Kozer in London about two weeks later. A very remarkable man from South Africa. And I asked him, I told him the story. And he said, it's very simple, Julia. You have to. And if it takes three years, you have to because you will not develop the kind of trust amongst people that they will reveal what you need to develop your cultural intelligence unless you will stand up to cultural intolerance. So very quickly, if I were you and I was starting on this week, this extraordinary strange week that you're on, mm -hmm. I thought last night and I thought, what are the eight things I'm going to suggest to them? Here they are. Firstly, is do not, if your aim is to leave this week without offending anybody, raise your aspirations rapidly. <laughs> Make sure that you have courageous conversations where your cause and flexes are crossing and imbibe cultural intelligence as a result of it. First one. Second, do not leave here with networks and a load of business cards. Um, you must leave here with relationships. Some of those will be relationships that will be the source of great support to you. Some of those will be relationships that will cause you enormous headaches because they'll be turbulent relationships. Think, make your list of all the people you know. If you phone them up, they'll tell you what they really think and you don't want to hear it. And make sure that you increase that list as a result of this week. People who will say, no, that's not a good idea. They might even say, this would be. Three, make sure you move just a few things from your core to your flex this week. People did it last year. You must do it this year. Next year, more people will do it. If you haven't, you have simply tried, not tried hard enough. Four, don't just find your core, flex your flex. Flex is a muscle. All muscles need exercise. Flex it. Five, be brave about the things in your core which shouldn't be there and either move them or deal with them. Six, be generous when you see other people doing the same thing as you're doing this week. They may be stumbling and they may be making fools of themselves. So help them and give them some cultural intelligence in so doing. Seven, remember that if you are or have been a recipient of cultural intolerance at moments through your life, that does not make you immune to being culturally intolerant yourself. Yeah? And I think then the last one would be find some questions that you might try out with other people that might reveal cultural intelligence. 
So I chose my father's favorite one. He used to sit. He used to sit at the table and he always would have a, a sort of piece of paper, a sort of A4 piece of paper that was sort of folded up, always in his pocket here, yeah? And he would always have a beautifully, beautifully sharpened pencil in his pocket here. And when there were lots of people at a table, he used to lean across the table so that you knew that there was nobody he was interested in the world in other than the people at that table. And he used to show them this picture. He used to say, what influences your leadership decisions the most? The past, the present, or the future? And he used to say, tell me how big your circles are, the past, the present, and the future. <coughs> and here, I do it all the time, trying to be like my father. Um, here's three examples over the last few weeks. From individuals, right? So these are not representative groups. The first one, was a Russian businessman I met the other day who said to me, the past is enormous, it feeds everything for me. The present is relatively small and the future is tiny because it may never happen. And in itself it revealed to me a great deal about how he thought and how he behaved and how he made his decisions. A young, the second person was a young man in India who said that the past for him was tiny because he rejected his parents' obsession with the past. He was not interested in it anymore. He wanted to sweep it away. He said that the present was pretty important and that the future was enormous because the opportunities were vast. And then the third one, I won't ask you to guess, was a woman who was on that program in Cambridge, a US businesswoman, who said that the past was tiny because it should be swept away. It was irrelevant. Where you came from before, the past, everything in the past is irrelevant. Only now matters. And then she used this extraordinary expression. She said to me, the future, we can fix it. And for me, it helped enormously in trying to figure out how you operate with the US, how whenever I talk about the past, I find it very difficult because somehow I become slightly irrelevant with some of the people I'm talking to because I'm hankering back to a past. Well, for me, it's not hankering back from a past. It's trying to understand a past. But this was a, a small and silly exercise my father used to use. And he slowly built up his cultural intelligence over many years. And I can say that I never, ever, ever saw him miss the opportunity of an encounter to develop his cultural intelligence. And I think the truth is, it's an extraordinarily long journey, um, which certainly in my case has often been quite painful and certainly deeply embarrassing. Um, I believe that the reward is great. I believe that cultural intelligence, IQ, IQ, IQ is what will continue to recruit people for because we've got no imagination to do anything but that. I believe that EQ is what we'll continue to sack people for a few years later or for the absence of because in the pursuit of IQ they missed out on EQ. But I deeply believe that in the future we will be promoting for cultural intelligence the ability to thrive not just to cross boundaries, but to thrive across boundaries. And I believe that it'll define the winners amongst the leaders, amongst the organizations, amongst the cities where the world will convene. Leaders with no cultural intelligence will be irrelevant in those cities. 
and across countries. And I think, to me, that if you become a leader with cultural intelligence who can connect up the world, innovation is great. Innovation, I agree with whoever said it. Passionately, I agree. It is mixtures of society that mean that we innovate. But mixtures aren't enough. You have to have well-led discord, not just discord. Um, so you connect up the world. And if you do, I believe you can become a leader who can make two and two, make 10, and wouldn't that be lovely? Thank you.